this is Distant Replay. Well, as we prepare for the 2021 NFL Draft, we thought we'd go back and relive some other previous draft moments. We did that already with the 2004 NFL Draft with Eli Manning, Philip Rivers, and Ben Roethlisberger and how that all unfolded. Today, our documentary recap is going to be Elway to Marino. This is a focus on the 1983 draft and the two big quarterbacks in that and everything that happened in between those two guys in the draft. There's some pretty crazy scenarios and how it unfolded and what these teams were looking for and kind of how how a draft plays out right in real time. And the cool part is this is all based on notes taken by the agent <laughs> that represented both guys. So we know this is all firsthand info, kind of an inside look at how these things develop and pretty remarkable so that's the goal today on distant replay so mike you know before we start you told me that this is you might have you might have said this is your favorite 30 for 30 it's definitely in the top two or three look i'm a documentary guy we're a documentary not a documentary channel but it's a big part of our channel so that's high praise and i look at the 1983 nfl draft as being the best nfl draft ever i think you would think that just looking at who was picked in the draft never mind when you uncover all of the different storylines that played out, you know, while the draft was happening and before the draft happened. And Ben's right. In this documentary, we get a firsthand account from Marvin Demoff, the agent for John Elway and Dan Marino, who literally made a handwritten journal about all the conversations he had with teams about Marino and Elway. Um, and he did it for a very 1983 reason. Because if he hadn't talked to Dan Marino or John Elway, or Jack Elway, John Elway's father, in a couple days, he wanted to have accurate info to pass along to them. And how this draft played out literally affected the NFL for a decade and a half. Yeah, that's true. And there's a lot of what-if scenarios we're going to run through here as we kind of unpack this documentary. And I learned a lot along the way, but you know, just starting with Demoff, because obviously we're introduced to him early on, and I, I, it's pretty crazy, and I don't know that it – I don't know how common it is now, Mike. I don't really pay that close attention to representation for the, for these guys nowadays. But for a guy to represent two of the high-profile players at the same position, and it was interesting that, that when he was talking with, um, I guess he asked Marino, he was representing Elway first, right? And then asked Marino yes. if he's okay with that, knowing that Elway is also being represented by him. And Marino is like, yeah, guy's a good quarterback too, basically. Like, just Marino just shrugged it off like, I know I'm good, he's good too, like, you know, it is what it is. Very Marino answer, <laughs> you know, um, you know, sure of himself. So what does he care? But it's crazy that, um, that that played out that way, but it works out well because we get to see a very unique vantage point of how this thing all unfolded. So basically kind of leading up to this draft, you have two different quarterbacks, right? You got a West Coast guy in LA. You got a blue collar guy in Dan Marino growing up in Pittsburgh, uh, playing for Pittsburgh. You know, they, they were kind of a better program at the time. We're on the cusp of a national championship. I think we're championship favorites, maybe, or at least expected to be in that mix. Marino's senior year, but he had a big drop off. And I think I don't know. You know, nowadays, now that we're what forty years removed, almost. Mike, I guess most people don't really know about the college careers as much as they do the NFL careers of these guys. But you know, Elway was kind of on the rise all the way to the very end, whereas Marino kind of peaked his junior year at an incredible year, and then even by his own accord said, "Hey, my senior year, I just, I just." did not play well. And they attributed a lot of that to possible drug use. Yeah, that was a, that's been, you know, if you know anything about the 83 draft and why Marino slipped, you're like, "Why well, I man, yeah, there was, you know, rumors of him and cocaine, you know, that was the that was the big rumor and his roommate in college, a guy named Jimbo Covert, which if you're a Bears fan or a University of Pittsburgh fan, you know that name, a very very good offensive tackle, played at Pitt with Dan Marino and was Dan Marino's roommate. And is in this documentary and says that said that you know a high profile general manager asked him about Marino's drug use. So this wasn't something that was like below the surface surface and was never substantiated. You have covert saying, look, in interviews with teams, I had people asking me about it. Yeah, and we even get the perspective of um, one of the Roonies, right? And and the good thing about this documentary too is you have a lot of people involved in this, so we get a lot of firsthand accounts of everything that's going on. But it even seemed like Pittsburgh even talked about. Hey, they looked into it, the Steelers being right there in the backyard of Marino, or he's in their backyard, and they looked into it and found that there was nothing to the, the drug use, but they were like, let's keep that quiet, and, and let's not bring that out. Let people think that. Yeah, they. I mean, to the point where, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a hometown, Marino's a hometown kid, you know. 
So Art Rooney, the owner of the Steelers at the time, you know, the Rooney family, very well known, literally had like private investigators and former police detectives of the Pittsburgh police look into it, and they couldn't substantiate any of the claims with the drug use. So you would think, hey, maybe Pittsburgh's very interested in getting Marino. Seems like it would make a lot of sense, but we'll get to that as we roll along. So that's kind of gives some background on where these guys are going into the draft. But even with, you know, with the way Marino played and, you know, how he was looking, you know, going into this and the drug rumors and all that stuff, he was still expected to be near the top of this draft, right? I mean, by all accounts, he's still 1A, 1B in this in this draft with John Elway. That's the way that's the I think it was a situation. Remember when um, Andrew Luck and Robert Griffin were like the clear one, two picks? Yeah. But it was like, hey, look, Robert Griffin's really good, but he's not Andrew Luck. That it was never a doubt like who who Indianapolis was going to take that year. I think people thought it was that kind of situation. Okay. We're like, hey, look, Elway's far and away. People call Elway like the best prospect they've ever scouted. Even a t- er- Ernie Accorsi even says as much in this, uh, you know, in this doc, Ernie Accorsi the general manager of the Baltimore Colts during this NFL draft. And it was a situation where they were thought to be the one and two QBs heading into it, which is why it made it so much more stunning as uh, when Marino fell as much as he did. Yeah. So with Elway, now you got this whole storyline of him not wanting to play for, for Baltimore, the Colts and um, Elway's father was also a head coach in college. Okay. So you know, he had those connections, and they had heard and, and, and talked to you know, people in that franchise that were just like, you know, you don't want to play here, right? You don't want to be a part of this organization. You're not going to thrive here. So he, he made it known that I don't want to be taken by the Colts, and the Colts were there for the number one pick, and he was obviously the likely guy there, and he made it known that I'm not going to. But what he had in his back pocket was the ability to play baseball and play at a high level. And it's pretty remarkable, that A, that he was drafted by the Yankees, right? The Yankees went ahead and took a shot. Let's draft him. Let's see what happens. Maybe he decides not to play. Who knows? But they let him play in like a summer league, right? And essentially, he was really good. Like even to the point where, you know, he's he's leading the team in like every offensive category. Like not just, okay, let's throw him out there like a Tim Tebow, right? Your boy Tim Tebow. It's like this guy could legitimately be a, a major factor in this, in this, this historic uh, franchise. Yeah, he played. I think they played. He said he played six weeks in in like summer league ball for the Yankees minor league team. Led the league in every offensive category when he was there, and got paid like seventy five grand. <laughs> not bad. That's such a Steinbrenner move, though. You know, he was right. not gonna. He wasn't gonna let you know the lore of a huge star like Elway pass him by. He felt it was worth the risk. That was pretty amazing. But that that was kind of like the leverage that Elway had going into this. So. You know, I think they had these conversations, and Dimoff says he has these conversations with the Colts about it. But you know, they are pretty much hell bent on taking it because, I guess, the biggest thing is you got Ernie Accorsi there, right, as the GM for the Colts, who we talked about in this 2004 um, draft, how he was involved on the other side of that. But Accorsi here is is trying to get a lot for this pick. I mean, he knows this is the best guy out there, and He's trying to get his money's worth. And he's also, at the same time, dealing with an owner and uh, Robert Ursay, who is making the job even tougher. Let's put it this way. As laid back as Jim Ursay is, I think that's <laughs> kind of Jim Ursay's <laughs> reputation, he's laid back, Yeah, is as eccentric as his father was. Yeah. Complete polar opposites. And Ernie, of course, his basic stance was, I am the general manager of a football team. Elway is the pick. I'm going to pick Elway. Like it's it was pretty much as black black and white as it can ima- you can imagine. Ernie Accorsi, very young. You got to remember, this is not the Ernie Accorsi we knew from the Giants. This is a very young Ernie Accorsi, really taking a stand here and saying, "I'm picking John Elway." And he had an he did have an asking price though. Did you write down what the asking price was? I didn't know. It was a lot. It was like three firsts. Two of them had to be in this draft, and then two seconds. One in this draft and one in the, in the next year's draft, I believe. So there, and there were only certain teams who could even pull off a trade. It was a sw- This is what it was. It was a swap of picks in the first round of this draft, two more first round picks, and then two second round picks. So <laughs> that was his asking price. And if you look at the draft, 
there was pretty much only one team that could do that, and that was the Chargers. Yeah. And the Chargers aspect of this was, so they had the number five pick, they had the number 22 pick in the first round, and they had the number 20 pick in the first round. All right? Yeah. So theoretically, a swap from one to five, and then those other two first-round picks is what, of course, he was looking for. Now, San Diego said they were interested in Elway, but Marvin Demoff was right, and he wrote down in his journal that he thinks the only reason the Chargers are saying they're interested in Elway is to give them leverage because they were negotiating a contract with Dan Fouts at the time. Yep, exactly. So the Chargers do not end up pulling the trigger on a trade to get John Elway, and they draft instead Billy Ray Smith, a linebacker from Arkansas at number five. Yeah, and, and what's crazy is, you know, so Corsi, who's trying to get this all figured out, and by the way, the, the draft the following year was not expected to have, like, any quarterback talent, So, which makes sense because there was six guys going in the first round this year. So you see there was just, it was just so front-loaded here. So that's why they didn't really care about moving to the next year because there wasn't nearly the talent there that they were going to have at their hand, their fingertips this year. So that's why it was such a focus on this draft. But they still, I mean, made a point. As soon as this, this sucker came out, it was like we're drafting him. And I thought that was cra- – I mean, just not even a – like what, literally one second into this draft, which, by the way, was the, the first time fans were allowed to an NFL draft. They lined up outside to get into this, like basically like a b- ballroom inside the Sheraton in New York City, like, a, like just like a conference room. And they had some guys piled in there, like taking notes on a notebook, like really old school, man. Like no cell phones, like people, like guys are jotting down their picks and like doing their mock drafts on their on their paper, uh, which was pretty crazy. Uh, but you know, as soon as they had the opportunity, they were up there with the pick. They, they tried to send a message. Yep, Ernie, of course, he said he told the secretary, which is so old school. The second after this draft begins, I want you to send the card, and I want you to tell them we're picking Elway. You know? Yeah. And, and, you know, this whole thing, too, which we made it interesting watching this now, Mike, is you, know, you had Pete Rozelle, commissioner, obviously. But now we have, like, this whole backdrop of uh, the Raiders and, and Al Davis and everything that was going on with that from, you know, the, the previous documentary we did on on that entire situation and how that all unfolded with, with the Raiders and the franchise and Al Davis. So you kind of know that's in the background as things are happening here. So it even made it a little more interesting kind of keeping up with this because you know what, what all is going on there too. But that also played a big part in this as well because, I mean, the Raiders, they had this whole like conspiracy theory going on, and, and for the most part, a lot of it could have probably been true. It probably was true, right, what Al Davis believed in the interference in the league and stuff like that. But you had that backdrop too, and it seemed like for a time the Raiders were going to pick him. Yeah, the Raiders had supposedly had a trade worked out with the Bears at six, right? Yeah. And they're, they supposedly had a trade all worked out. That would have given the Raiders the sixth pick, and I believe they were going to trade for the 18th pick as well, which the Bears had. And then the Raiders had the 26th pick. So that would have given them a pick in the top six and two other first-round picks to, you know, to be able to fit the criteria, of course, he was looking for. and But then the thinking is, uh, amongst people with the Raiders, is that Roselle nixed that trade so Al Davis wouldn't be in a position to get John Elway. Yeah. It is, it's pretty remarkable how many teams kind of seem to be lining up for that. And even the Broncos, too, right? I mean, the Broncos at that time, which is a really crazy story, because they talk with Chris Hinton, who's, who's on here, uh, on this documentary, and he gets drafted by the Broncos, and, and there was still talk. I mean, there was st- still that ability potentially for them to to have the picks and to make that trade, but they draft Chris Hinton, who said he arrived in Denver to like fanfare, signing autographs, and was like, "Man, well, I could not have been any luckier with where I ended up." And to kind of see how it all played out for him was was tough, but he had a heck of a career and he's handled it pretty well. Yeah, yeah, that was he was in the documentary, and I, I had never, to be honest, I didn't know who Chris Hinton was, so yeah, it was very interesting hearing from him. But yeah, you know, so it, the order went when Elway won to the Colts, the Rams and the Seahawks had a minor trade; they traded with each other at two and three. The Rams take Eric Dickerson, the Seahawks take Kurt Warner, the running back, not the quarterback. Yeah, the Broncos take Hinton at four, and what I thought was interesting was something to file away when you're watching the documentary is. The Broncos owner told Marvin Demoff and the Elways, like, don't worry, we really want him. We're going to get him. Just give us time. Yeah. You know, they were the only team that stayed calm, didn't try to make a trade, 
Didn't try to put something together, rush it, together rushing. I think the Denver Broncos owner was like, once I get Robert Ursay on the phone, we'll figure something out. It's just going to take a little bit of time. Yep. And the thing is, the reason why a Corsi wanted to pick in the top six as one of his criteria was he wanted to trade Elway, trade down, and still get Marino. Right. And he wanted to make sure he was ahead at, ahead of the Chiefs at seven because at seven is when the quarterback dominoes start to fall. And the Chiefs fit, pick Todd Blackledge. If you yeah. watch college football at all, you know who Todd Blackledge is. He was a quarterback at Penn State for their national championship team. And the funniest thing about – so we're through the Elway drama now. That's going to get tabled. And now it's about where's Marino going to go. Mm -hmm. And in this documentary, they have Marino – Every time a quarterback gets picked ahead of him, they have Marino in present time giving his reaction to it. And it's funny because Marino's trying to be, you know, really professional about it. But he's like, you know, I, I thought I had a better career than Todd and Todd's a nice guy. Marino yeah. just trying to hold back like you could still see how he felt he feels slighted even all these years later. And he, he always prefaces it, too. He's like, I've got nothing against Todd Blackledge. I like the guy, good guy, or whoever the quarterback is, right? He's like, i got nothing against so-and-so, uh, good guy, but I was a better player. And he's literally true. like, he's literally trying to hold back laughing because yeah. of how the careers turned out, you know? Like, exactly. I'm Dan Marino. He's Todd Blackledge, you know? <laughs> Great announcer, but not an NFL quarterback like I was. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's cool. We can kind of run down some of these picks, too. So, you know, because that's kind of what's unfolding. But in the background, too, as we look at and kind of keep an eye on Marino, and where he's going to land. In the background, you still have Dimoff dealing with Elway, who doesn't want to play for the Colts, and what's going to happen there. And meanwhile, Elway is putting it out in the media that he's going to go ahead and sign with the Yankees. Like, he's putting a deadline on Ursay and the Colts, saying, hey, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm going to go ahead and pull the trigger. So you've got this amount of time to get a trade done because you know I'm not playing. So either you're left with nothing – or you get it done before this deadline and we move on, which that's a pretty bold move, man. And and you see it with these with him and his dad, which you know you kind of compare that to to Archie. His dad, I kind of like this dad. I, I, you know, Archie was seemed like overburdened, um, just really kind of in control, you know, just kind of leading Eli. But his dad just like these two guys just seemed like they knew what was best, they knew what they they wanted, what they needed, and they had plenty of options. They weren't afraid to exercise. I think that, that Marvin Demoff helped in this situation because I just think he told the Elway, say, look, you're going to have your press conference. You're going to have what, you know, whatever you're going to do. Just hit on the fact that we, we, we told the Colts we don't want to go there and that we're going to pursue baseball. That's right. all you have to do and let it play out. You know, I think Marvin Demoff's influence on that was key. Yeah, who, he was pulling a lot of strings as he kind of read through his his notes. We don't, you know, we can't break them all down. It's, I just, you know, would say go ahead and watch the documentary and uh, you'll kind of see him as he's reading through them. But we get down the list a bit further, and we get to the Bills, which this is another little, kind of a side note to this whole documentary, is Jim Kelly's here, right? So we know how good Jim Kelly is. He gets drafted by the Bills. Jim Kelly comes from Miami. He says, you know, he tells his agent, his agent, because his agent says, hey, listen, these guys don't want to, or Elway doesn't want to play somewhere. Is there anywhere you don't want to play? You know? And Kelly says, Min Minnesota, who maybe one other place. Green Bay. Green, Green Bay. Bay, yep, Green Bay, and then Buffalo. These cold weather places coming from South Florida, I don't, I don't want to play there. And of course, Buffalo, he, the first time through doesn't take him. They have a pick at twelve. Don't take him. He's like, thank goodness, I don't, I don't have to go. But two picks later, Buffalo has a pick they got from Cleveland, and drafts him at quarterback. And it's crazy because the, the whole other side of this is the USFL is launching right now in '83, and they're drafting guys too. And and he gets drafted by a team in the USFL. And actually decides to take that that job instead of this one, which you think about it now, Mike, it absolutely blows your mind. It's crazy. So he doesn't come to the Bills till 1986, which was surprising to me that he, you know, when you look at it, you know, he played 13 years in pro football, but only 10 for the Bills. And you know, when I think of Jim Kelly, one of the things I think of is how much he loves Buffalo and Buffalo loves him. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, and just to hear the old clips of him talking about Buffalo. Like when even when he was in Houston, he was playing, he's like he's like I'll give you a good reason. Would you rather be in Buffalo or would you rather be in Houston? You know, like <laughs> right. just really slamming Buffalo whenever he could, but obviously that relationship changed tenfold and he's like, you know, Buffalo's favorite son now. So Yeah. Um, I had no idea about that. Yeah, yeah, neither did I. So the Bills were the next team that was potentially going to pick a quarterback and the Patriots at 15. Patriots are next up. They're a team that is also in the market for a quarterback. And 
the connection here with the Colts. So they're hot for John Elway. Their head coach, uh, Ron Meyer, who if you follow college football, he's from SMU, really wants John Elway. They worked out a trade that involved John Hanna. Do you remember John Hanna? Of course. He's an Alabama great, Mike. Oh, that's right. Sorry about that. <laughs> they they were going to potentially work out a trade for John Hanna, and that, like, infuriated a Corsi. Like, this proposal was given to Ursay and head coach Frank Cush. And Frank Cush was, like, an, you know, offensive, defensive line guy, old school coach. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, I'd love to have John Hanna. And, and Ernie, of course, he stopped him and was like, look, if you make this trade, you're going to have two press conferences, one announcing the trade and one announcing that I quit. Yeah. Because I'm not going to be a part of this. Yeah. So in the end, Ursay does not make the trade with the Patriots, and the Patriots instead take Tony Eason. Again, Jim Kelly, Tony Eason. We'll get to Marino later. But, the, you know, these are quarterbacks that I'm very familiar with from my early, early years as a Jets fan. Yeah, and then we, let's get to the, the Steelers here, Mike. The Steelers are at 21, a few picks later. And the Steelers, I mean, they're, again, this is his hometown. They had done their, their due diligence on his background and felt comfortable about him. Yeah, and t- plus, Terry Bradshaw's in the back of his career, right? Like, he's, he's had an illustrious career. They've, they've been incredible during the 70s and uh, into the early 80s. And now they have a chance now to hand it off to Marino. I mean, that, that is remarkable. This falls into their lap at 21. But they take this guy... Gabriel Rivera out of Texas Tech, who, you know, by his film looked like a like an animal, just a huge dude that could run fast and get after it. They felt like he would fit in that that defensive. He kind of had that image, met, kind of lined up with their brand, right? What was his nickname? Senior Sack. <laughs> I love it, Senior Sack. So they drafted him instead, which I could not believe. Yeah, they, so they, you know, it comes down to Chuck Knoll, right? basically wanting to build a team the same way he did in the 70s. Yeah. On the defensive line, like they drafted Mean Joe Green. Well, they wanted Gabe Rivera to be that next guy on the defensive line. They didn't really have the foresight to see, like, all right, Terry Bradshaw's on his way out. Let's get the next guy in here. I mean, they had the guy right in their backyard. They did all this research on, and in the end, they don't end up taking him. Yeah, and the, and the, the worst part about it, he only played a handful of games, six games with the Steelers. Because uh, in October that year, he was paralyzed in a car wreck while driving drunk. And just a horrible story. We actually he's heard in from the, him here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, sorry to step on you. Yeah, he's in the documentary as well. It's even sad just seeing him in a wheelchair even to this day. Yeah. Um, he said passed I give, I give away, him, too. In 20, has he really? Yeah, 2018. All right, yeah. I give him credit for participating in the documentary. It's just a terrible story. Yeah, and who knows? It could have ended up being a great pick if things hadn't gone the way they did. But. Um, it was just another team, though, that passed up on, on Marino, and he and he looks back and says, probably in retrospect, it's better because I got out of town, right? I mean, anybody that grew up somewhere and then left, and you you learn a lot about yourself, right? I mean, for me, it was leaving the South and Alabama and, and moving to Connecticut, where I met you, Mike, and and working out there. You just get exposed to so many different things. You get out of your comfort zone, and you learn a lot. And I think uh, Marino kind of felt that way about about not ending up at Pittsburgh. He said he would have loved to play there, but. You know, everything worked out with him not landing there. Well said, Ben. Well said. There you go. So who do we have next, Mike? All right. So next we go down the list here. And before we get to the Jets, because they are next (laughs) at pick 24, one thing of note that we didn't mention was the fact that it was actually getting kicked around at pick number five, which we went through before how the Chargers ended up with that pick. That pick was originally owned by the San Francisco 49ers. And that Marvin Demoff had in his notes, you know, you have the Bill Walsh, John Elway at Stanford connection there. Right. That it was actually kicked around for a hot minute that they could trade Marie, uh, Montana for the rights to, you know, for the rights to Elway or for the rights to the first pick. Mm-hmm. And that Bill Walsh basically told Ernie, of course, he like, look, I could in the end, I can could just never trade Joe Montana. You know, I thought that was a pretty interesting part of this documentary. Yeah, it was. And right before uh, the and right before the Jets, too, are the Cowboys, who are also in the mix here. Oh, the Cowboys, too, yeah. So getting back to our order here, 23 to the Cowboys, they basically – they had Danny White at the time, right? Yeah. So their coach, right, the, the coach of the Colts at the time, was his former coach in college, right, at Arizona State, I think it was? It Danny was, White. Yeah. 
And yeah. so they were like, well, you know, he'd love to reunite with him so we could send him up there as part of a package. <laughs> and uh, that was, again, something that, of course, he didn't agree with. Yep, yeah, you're right. Exactly. I had forgotten how that played out. So now it's amazing how many teams were in a mix for these quarterbacks when you really go back and research it. it so now, it, And it shows you how, 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 uh, how big Elway was at the time, too, how everybody wanted to do what they could to get to him. Exactly. And we're still trying to figure out here where Marino is going to end up at pick 24. The Jets have picked 24. It's one of those situations where the no brainer pick here, I think in everyone's mind was Dan Marino. The Jets at this time had Richard Todd, who was not a terrible quarterback, um, but he's not Dan Marino. And obviously the Jets in true Jets fashion, take Ken O'Brien, which I think we know. I think everyone who's familiar with football knows Ken O'Brien but he's from California Davis, which is like a Division II program, I believe. Yeah. So obviously everyone at the draft in the moment is stunned. In Ken O'Brien's defense, he was not a terrible quarterback. Um, he was actually really good for the Jets. The Jets had a very good offense when he was there for some years. They had Wesley Walker, Altoon, Mickey Schuler, uh, Freeman McNeil. Like that, Their offense was not terrible when, when Ken O'Brien was there, but he wasn't Dan Marino. And you have Dan Marino playing in the same division – for the you know Ken O'Brien's whole career <laughs> and constantly being compared to him, yeah, that was and the best part of this documentary was people are trying to explain to Dan Marino, hey, this is probably why this guy got picked here. This is probably why this guy got picked over you. And when the Jets didn't pick him, Marvin Demoff just told him, look, these guys just aren't that smart. <laughs> Which <laughs> that would hit know, close was, to home was classic, yeah. And then you know, from my standpoint. This would begin an era of you went 83 to 99, having the Jets having to deal with Dan Marino, and not to mention 10 of those years also having to deal with Jim Kelly in the same division. And then right in 99, pretty much, you then have to deal with Tom Brady for the next 20 years. Hmm. So it's almost been, it's almost been from 83 to 2020. It was almost, yeah, uh, Very remarkable. Know. But Ken O'Brien had a winning record against Marino, right? Then they flashed that up there. He did, yeah, yeah. The Jets again. The Jets were not bad during Marino uh, during O'Brien's tenure. They weren't. Yeah, but not Marino. <laughs> no, it wasn't setting passing records. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh so so great. So then finally, so we're we're coming down the stretch here, and you know the the Raiders are back in the mix again here, which that was crazy too. I mean, kind of refresh me on what's going on there at the Raiders because. Yeah, Al Davis here is in the middle of like his lawsuit and everything. Yeah, the trial for the lawsuit ended like months before the draft. And with Marvin Demoff was good friends with Al Davis, right? And Marvin Demoff could tell by the questions Al Davis was asking about Dan Marino that Al Davis hadn't had time to prep for the draft because he was distracted by the trial. Like he was asking Marvin Demoff, like, hey, can Marino throw the ball deep? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and Marvin Demoff told Al Davis, like, don't ever tell that to anyone else because you know, Dan Marino can basically throw the ball farther than we've ever seen, you know right. what I mean, or, or whatever. So, you know, the Raiders decide not to take Dan Marino. They take Don Mosbar, a center from USC, who, again, who ended up being a pretty good player, obviously not Dan Marino. And if you look at it this way, they supposedly had a trade worked out to try to get John Elway, and they passed up on Dan Marino. <laughs> and the Raiders are a team that, you know, would go a pretty long stretch without having a good quarterback. Yeah. Well, you see you see that all the time with these teams that pass up on a big quarterback. It ends up just costing them for years and years and years. It's not a one-year decision. Like, it ends up in, uh, impacting the franchise for, for many, many years. But then finally, the Dolphins are right there at the end of this draft, 27th in the first round. And it all lines up. That I mean, just to be able to fall into the, the lap of the Dolphins at that time is pretty remarkable. But, but Marino finally got the call. Yeah, and, you know, this part of this documentary, you know, they're making it sound like the Dolphins really wanted Marino. It's like, you know, there's a difference between really wanting someone and someone just falling in your lap. Yeah. Uh, they knew the Jets were going to pick a quarterback, you know. It's not like they tried to trade ahead of the Jets, you know. Right. So, um, you know, it's just one of those things where, I don't know. It worked out. Good for the, Do good for the Dolphins. Yeah. <laughs> I can't even act excited for the Dolphins. <laughs> Uh, but back to but back to Elway now. So we got we got the landing spot from Marino. So how does Elway get to the Broncos? Well, that's another pretty crazy story, and one that of course he's not too excited about because essentially it all happened behind closed doors and didn't involve a Corsi. 
It didn't. No. So so what ended up happening is you have a meeting at you know in the days after the draft in Las Vegas between the owner of the Broncos and Robert Ursay, and they work out a trade for John Elway. And just like the Denver owner told uh, John Elway's camp the day of the draft, you know, just give him some time, he'll get him to Denver, and that's exactly what he did. He was in the middle of hanging out with some friends and basically packed his bag in, in the in the closet without them knowing and kind of snuck out the back door, hopped on a flight, went to Seattle, picked somebody up, and then went to Denver, signed the papers on the airplane on the runway. He went to pick up the owner. The, yeah. He went to pick up the owner of the team in Seattle, <laughs> owner of the Broncos in Seattle, then they flew to Denver to sign the paperwork. <laughs> and the news broke in the middle of an NBA playoff game, the Denver NBA playoff game. Pretty remarkable, man. And, and then you see how, obviously, how always career played out. And and um, But what I thought what was cool is that, that Demoff is still really, really close with these guys to this day and have had a big impact on their lives. And Marino even says, you know, had a huge impact in kind of helping. Was it him or was it Elway? Elway or Marino said he had a huge impact, you know, losing their parents and, and he's kind of been the, the rock for them in, in their life. I think it was think Elway. It, yeah, I think it was Elway, yep. yeah. But either way, it's just pretty cool to see. And then, you know, obviously these two guys went on to be two of the greatest of all time and will always be uh, in that rarefied air. Yeah, I mean, there's, look, this 1983 NFL draft in the first round quarterback-wise was bookended by Elway and Marino, two of the best ever. You have another Hall of Famer in Jim Kelly picked right in the middle of the first round. And just other quarterbacks that didn't meet expectations and the franchises they were drafted to dealt with the consequences for a long time. Ken O'Brien, AFC Player of the Year in 85. Yeah, like I told you, Ken <laughs> O'Brien wasn't bad. You know, That's what people think of Ken O'Brien. Ken O'Brien was known for, Ben, when he went to the games, when I used to go to the games when I was a kid, <laughs> okay. was his quarterback rating was always high, they said, because he took a lot of sacks. <laughs> so even like if you go to a Jet game now, if you're sitting next to an old school Jet fan yeah. and they show a Kenny O'Brien highlight on the like the Jumbotron, they'll scream, "Take the sack, Kenny!" Yeah, <laughs> you, like, know, you know, honestly, and I think about Jets quarterbacks. I mean, obviously, you know, Joe Namath is is number one, but you know, maybe Boomer for a small stretch. He wasn't um, good. Boomer wasn't good with the Jets. Okay, but I mean, so I'm just thinking about as an outsider who thinks about Jets quarterbacks. Ken O'Brien's pretty high on my list. Yeah, he is. So he probably had the best sustained period with the Jets in my lifetime, probably. Yeah. Uh, you know, Vinny probably had the best season in '98, but he didn't yeah, really have sustained. That's right. He yeah. didn't have sustained success because he got hurt the next year. Right. Chad's probably the next best. Pennington. Look, it's just again, this is like dumb. we. It seems like this happens every episode, which <laughs> kind of depresses me a little bit. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we won't go down that road any further, Mike. Uh, but all, all in all, a good documentary. We, we recommend it. Again, it's an ESPN 30 for 30. It is Elway to Marino, released in 2013, directed by Ken Rogers and produced by NFL Films. And it's a great inside look at how everything unfolded and a really good one to go back to and one that Mike absolutely recommends. Absolutely recommend it. If you're a football fan, if you're a, if you're a, and especially if you're a big-time draft person this time of year or, or, or all year now, it seems like it's a year-round industry now, it's an absolute must-watch. Well, that'll do it for this episode of Distant Replay. We'll be back with uh, more documentary recaps. If you have a suggestion, shoot it over to us. And uh, make sure you subscribe to the podcast, follow us wherever you listen to podcasts, and we'll be back again soon with another episode. Until next time.